We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Happy to see you all here this morning. Isn't it amazing to celebrate baptisms together? Yeah. You know, we had uh, nine baptisms scheduled today. There's more in the next service, but three of the baptisms you saw this morning weren't scheduled. So uh, you, you do the math, by the end of the day, we're going to have baptized more people in the first half of this year than we did the entirety of last year. How amazing is that? Uh, so God willing, that's going to be an exciting moment uh, just to see what God is doing in this place. I'll tell you, as a pastor, uh, that's probably the top of the list for the best parts of my job right there. Um, it's pretty cool. Hey, we haven't had a chance to meet yet. My name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as the lead pastor, and really glad that you're here. Hopefully, maybe after service, we can meet outside in the lobby or outside in the parking lot somewhere, bump fists or shake hands or side hug or something. Uh, I'm good with all those things. And hey, uh, any of you ever, uh, my generation, there was something we used to say to each other in high school. I don't know if we still say this. Maybe you guys can confirm. But we used to look at our friends and say like, especially when they're acting kind of silly, we'd say, hey, don't be a tool. I, don't, I never really understood what that phrase meant. Like, why would you look at someone else and say, hey, don't be a tool? Uh, why, why would you say that to someone? What does that even mean? But by the end of the message today, I think you'll understand what it means when you say to someone, don't be a tool, all right? So keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to it. Uh, we've been going through this series. So I say we've been going through it. We started last week. We're in the second week of the series called, I Will Build My Church. This, this phrase right here, we uh, give the quotation right, you know, to Jesus because he's the one who said it in Matthew 16, 18, all right? So when you see these words in Matthew 16, 18, I want you guys to say them with me, all right? So here we go. Matthew 16, 18, it says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Listen, our 815 service was louder than that. So we're going to do it again. It says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. That's right. And the powers of hell will not conquer. You see, Jesus made this statement. He made this promise that he was going to build this church. And, and we're part of that, and we got to ask ourselves, well, what does this mean? What is the church? What are we a part of? What is this thing that Jesus is building? And so for, throughout this series, you're going to see this verse a lot because we're, we're talking about what the church is. It's kind of a, a fancy word, ecclesiology. It's a theology of the church. What is the church meant to be? What is it? What is it not? It's the whole basis of this series. And today, we're going to talk about the concept of a church unified, a church that is unified. When I was in Ecuador uh, the past, uh, for, for 10 days, the past couple Sundays, I was with a, a team of students and adults, and we were doing an incredible, uh, they were doing an incredible job. I just got to witness it, but it was incredible. At one point, we were at this soup kitchen sort of thing where the church was preparing food for some hungry people in the community, and the food wasn't quite ready yet. And so they came up to me, the, the pastor's wife came up to me and said, it's going to be about another 45 minutes. All the people have already arrived. Dinner's supposed to be being served, but it's not. And she just says, can you entertain them? <laughs> I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I forgot my top hat and my cane, but I'll, hey, hello, my, no, I, I, I don't know what to do. So uh, we, we got this idea, and one of our, our missionaries that we were with, we got him a guitar, and we're like, why don't we sing some of our songs, our worship songs in English. 
And we don't, you know, we only had a couple on our group that knew Spanish. We're like, we're going to sing and it'll just be a blessing to these people. So he gets out a guitar and he starts playing the song Waymaker. And we start singing the song Waymaker in English. And supposedly this is a song that is also very popular in Ecuador in Spanish. So they start singing too in Spanish. And before we know it, they're singing very, very loudly and with everything they've got in, in Spanish, and we're singing with everything we've got in English, and it's just this beautiful mix of two languages worshiping the same God. And when I think of a church unified, that's what I, that's what I think is a great illustration of that, because you think about it, like we... We don't want to be a church unified in a way that like all of us dress the same. We don't all want to think the same. You know, we don't want to all like have the same favorite ice cream. And like we're all different in this room. We're, we're different. And in this case, we even spoke different languages. We looked differently. Our cultures were different. Our languages were different. But we were unified in that moment because there was evidence that we all shared the same Holy Spirit. It was so powerful. And so while we don't want to be a church that, all, that everyone just kind of thinks alike, we don't, want, we don't want that. We do want to be a church that recognizes that we share something powerful, more powerful than favorite ice cream. We share, uh, we have a Holy Spirit in common. So what does that look like to maintain that? And believe it or not, it's actually pretty difficult to maintain that kind of unity in the church. Let me, let me show you what I mean. And, and by the way, when I say the church, a lot of us, we picture like this building, right? If someone says, hey, I'm going to church, you're thinking of an address that you put in your GPS, right? But if this church were to burn down tomorrow, I hope it doesn't, but if it were, we would still gather. We'd find a way to gather because the church isn't brick and mortar. It's not a building. It's the people, right? You in this room, if you're a believer and you've gathered together with other believers, you share a Holy Spirit in common, you are this invention that God created called the church. And so I, I want to walk us through this, this kind of exercise of logic, okay? So here's, I wanna, I'm going to give you a, a sentence to say, and if you can say that sentence with confidence, if you actually believe what I'm asking you to say, I want you to say it with me, all right? So the first sentence is this. It's going to be, I love the Lord. All right, so if you really believe that, can you say it with me? Ready? I love the Lord. And see, a lot of you said that with so much confidence because you really love the Lord, and that's great. All right, well, how about this one? Uh, the Lord loves the church. All right, say that with me. If you believe that the Lord loves the church, will you say that with me with confidence? The Lord loves the church. Right, we know that. We, we open up Scripture, and it shows us that God created that Jesus invented the church, right? And on Peter, he says, Peter, you're the rock on which I'm going to build this thing. It was his idea. Of course he loves it. How about this sentence? I love what the Lord loves. Do you believe that you love what the Lord loves? If, if you do, would you say that with me? I love what the Lord loves. All right, so now we're going to use some basic logic. All right, I love the Lord. The Lord loves the church. I love what the Lord loves, and so we're going to land on this logic statement. You ready? We're going to all say it together, therefore, I love the church. Here we go. Therefore, I love the church. Now, you guys all said that with a lot of confidence, which is exciting to me. What, what I've learned from experience is oftentimes when someone's asked to say something like, I love the church, they're willing to say it because they understand the logic. I love the Lord. The Lord loves the church. I love what the Lord loves. So I've got to love the church. And so you say it. But what we want to do in our human nature is we want to, we want to put like a, a footnote next to that. Listen, I love the church, but not that church. Not the one over there. Not that church. Or, I, I love the church, but only when this and or it that. And if the, because you know what a lot of us share in common is we have an experience from our past where the church has let us down so powerfully that when somebody asks you to say, I love the church, you're thinking, uh, I don't know if I want to say that. But at the end of the day, those who love the Lord should also love the church with all of its faults, with all of its frailty, with all of its issues and problems. You see, the Bible says that we should be unified through this bond of peace. And here's, here's what it says in Ephesians 4.3. It says, make every effort 
to keep yourselves unified or united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So Paul, when he's writing to this church in Ephesus, he's telling them, listen, you guys need to be united. But one of the things that he says that's really interesting in this passage is he says, make every effort. You know what that means? Is that it's not going to be easy. You don't just walk into church and like, woo, this unity thing just comes naturally to us. It's saying you're going to have to make an effort. It's going to be work. You're going to have to put some work in. It's going to be hard. Sometimes it's not going to be easy. But at the end of the day, we're commanded to put in the work to stay united by the bond of peace. You want to know why it's going to take work? (laughs) You want to know the biggest problem with the church? It's you all. It's me. It's the people. The people in the church are the best part of the church and the worst part of the church. Here's why the people in the church make up the best part of the church. Without people, you don't have a church, right? When this building is empty, there is technically no church here. You are the church. So without people, there is no church. So the best part of the church is the people. But the worst part of the church is the people. All of us, we're messed up, we're broken. I put this down, uh, anywhere there are people, there are problems. Do you know that to be true? I've also heard it said, um, this church cannot be perfect as long as you're here. It's a a sad truth I wanna wanna share with you. When I was preparing this message, I didn't know if I wanted to be this vulnerable. But I've always had a really, I think, a a gift. I'm I'm about to turn 43. I've been in ministry for eight years. I don't know why I put up 10 fingers. Eight years. I'm good at math, right? Eight years. And all the way up until I went into ministry, I've always been really good about reconciling quickly, about loving people. Like I've never, if anyone ever asked me, hey, do you struggle with feelings of hatred towards other people? I'd be like, I do not, I do not. It's kind of something that comes naturally. Just love, I love people. They mess up, they do something, whatever, I get over it real quick, I, I, whatever. That's never been a weakness of mine until I went into ministry. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm being really vulnerable, Okay. These last eight years were the first eight years of my life where I've actually struggled with feelings of hatred towards people. I'm like, what is wrong? Like, I've finally stepped into a place where, like, I'm a shepherd, and I'm supposed to love people, I'm supposed to come, they hired me because this is supposed to come naturally to me. And somehow, all of a sudden, I find myself in a, in a group full of people that let each other down, that let me down, I let them down, and then we just, I don't know, it's a struggle. I'm just being real with you, and you know that it's a struggle for you too, right? See, you've likely been hurt by the church, maybe, probably even this church at some point, someone within the church. I'm not just, when I say the church, I don't just mean like the leaders, maybe some other body, a brother or sister in Christ has let you down. You've been hurt by the church, which has caused you to want to pause when somebody asks you to say the phrase, I love the church. You're like, I love the church, as long as so-and-so is not here today. See, the truth is, we hear in that that initial verse, right, in Matthew 16, where Jesus says, I am going to build my church. I'm going to build the church. And we also know in Scripture that Satan likes to destroy and, and ruin anything that God is building. If God is building it, Satan is going to do everything he can to destroy it. Well, we know at the end of the verse, it says that even the powers of hell are not going to be able to overcome the church. Satan is not going to be able to destroy the church. But if he can't destroy it, he's certainly going to put a lot of effort into making sure it doesn't grow, make sure it's not healthy, even watching it decline. If he can make the church decline and get it to the point where, listen, Jesus says it's never going to be technically destroyed, but I can get it on life support. He's going to do it because that's what he, he hates, the things that God loves. You don't want to know how he does it, how he tries to deceive and divide and destroy. 
He does it by offending us, by offending people. In fact, let me, let me show you. Um, a recent study was done, and the top reasons why people leave a church. Are you ready for this? Top reasons people leave a church. 10% of you are going to leave this church because you're going to die here, right? You're going to stop worshiping here, and you're going to worship somewhere much better. 10% will leave this church due to death. 12%, and I think this number is a lot higher in the Glen Burnie area, are going to leave this church because of a job relocation, right? You get moved somewhere else, and you're going to start attending another church. That's good. Do that, okay? 12% are going to move because of a theology disagreement, a major theological thing, and they're like, hey, I can't get over this. We're going to move to a church that aligns with what I believe the Bible says. That's a good reason to leave a church, too. If you ever hear us teach something from this pulpit that doesn't align with God's word, you have my blessing. Get out of here. My wife will be with you, right? She'll be like, what are you, what are you saying? Um, 66% of the people who leave a church, though, leave because they are offended or uncomfortable. Something happened within the church that you just didn't like. It made you uncomfortable. I, you know, no one waved at me. No one said hi today. I was in the hospital. Nobody came to visit. No one called me when I was expecting it. So-and-so forgot my name. He called my name through three times. He, he, he's called me the wrong thing. He, there's, the coffee is lousy. The, they, they made me sit in the front row. Would you guys, I'm sorry, just stick around, all right? They have bad parking. You know, it takes me like 15 minutes to get out of there. So I'm just going to go find another church. That word offense in, in the Greek is actually the word scandalon, where we get the word scandal. And it's another word for a trap. And you know that a trap doesn't actually work unless you put bait in it. You got to put something in the trap to be able to get someone caught up in it, right? In, in this scandal or in this this offense. Well, do you know what Satan uses as bait for this trap? It's people. He puts disagreements and problems within people within the church. This is the thing that he's going to try to do to offend you so that the church is not united or unified the way it's supposed to be. So think about this. This is kind of an overarching statement for today, and then we're going to, I'm going to give you my points. Number one, uh, not number one, the, the big overarching point is being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. Every one of you in this room, you are going to be offended. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. But you get to decide whether or not you whether you're a, a constant victim and you just choose to, to always go around offended, offended, offended. All right, so how do we be a church, how to be a church that is unified? In other words, how do you live in such a way where you're not so easily offended? And here's the first thing I want to challenge you to think about, to have realistic expectations of other people, to have realistic expectations of other people. Let me tell you, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the place they've created called heaven... The, that's all perfect. All of us in this room, including your staff, your pastors, your life group leaders, your whatever, we are imperfect. And so one of the things we have to understand is everything else falls miserably short of perfection. In other words, let me just ask you as your lead pastor, please don't put me on a pedestal. Don't expect me to be perfect. And then the moment you realize, oh my goodness, my pastor isn't perfect. By the way, I assume most of you a long time ago figured that out. <laughs> if you're new here, all right? Ecclesiastes verse seven, or chapter seven, verse 20 says, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Not a single person. There was one guy that pulled it off one time is Jesus, but he's not on this earth in a bodily form anymore, all right? There, not a single one of us in this room is perfect and always good. Someone all, in the church is always going to say something stupid. They're going to let you down. They're going to forget to call. They're going to whatever. And I, I can, just being honest, there are plenty of times in this church 
where after the fact I look back and say, you know what? I should have called. I should have been in that hospital room. I should have written a thank you card. I should have, I should have. At the end of the day, I recognize that every one of us in this room, we're not perfect. We're going we're gonna to drop some balls from time to time. And it's important to understand not to put people in this church on a pedestal. In fact, I'll say this. If this church hasn't let you down, just wait. We will. There will be a point at which something happens here. Someone says something. There's a word that slips out. There's something. You're going to be offended at some point. And if your thought process is, well, I'm just going to go on and, and find the perfect church. And you're just going to keep skipping churches over and over again because you're never going to find it. You have to have realistic expectations of other people. Acts chapter 10 gives us a really great example of someone who found themselves in a situation like this. Uh, so, so Peter, it says, as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshiped him. So remember, Peter, Jesus says, hey, Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Well, Cornelius must have heard, Peter, you are the rock, and you're going to build my, you're, you're the man. But that's not the case. Peter says, listen, but Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I am a human being just like you. What we learn from this is, listen, honoring other people in the church, honoring your leaders, that's a good thing. Worshiping them, that's a really bad thing. Don't expect from people what only God can give you. That's why we make a big deal about Jesus around here, because he's the only thing around here that's perfect. All right, here's, here's the second thing. If you want to be a church, if we want to be a church that's unified, number two, we need to resolve problems as soon as they arise. Notice I didn't say resolve problems if they arise. All right, let me say it again. Problems will arise in this church. Someone in this church sitting next to you is going to let you down. So when they arise, resolve them as, quick, as quickly as possible. You know what most people do instead of fixing a problem? They do two other things instead because our sin nature thinks these two other things are a little bit more fun. One, we blow up. Or two, we stir up. And let me tell you what that looks like. And you can probably find yourself guilty of some of these. I certainly am. Uh, the blow up one, instead of solving the problem, we like to blow up. And what, what I mean by that is it's when you, right, you, you're offended, you know, someone hurts you, and instead of dealing with it, you just let yourself explode with anger. And it, Proverbs, or let, me, let me ask you this. Have any of you ever said something that you regret, that you wish you could take back? You said something in anger? I think every hand should be up for that, right? We've all done that before. Um, it says in Proverbs 14, verse 17, it says, short-tempered people do foolish things, and schemers are hated. You know what I, I love about this verse? It reminds me, in my own home, foolish things happen from time to time. For me, for my wife, for my kids, one of the things we're really careful about, I don't tell my kids, you are a fool. Because they're not foolish. Sometimes they act foolish. So what I say is, you're acting like a fool right now. You're behaving like a fool. You're letting your, you know, a full vent, uh, you're opening up the vents to your anger and just letting it all out at once. And the Bible says that when you do that, you're acting like a fool. And so we need to learn not to blow up when a problem arises, but instead to to have a different approach when problems arise. I've heard it said that when you're angry, you will make the best speech you'll ever regret. <laughs> My dad taught me a lesson like this. My dad's not living anymore, but it, one of the, the benefits of having a father who's deceased is I've already kind of thought through all the incredible lessons of my dad. And I get to think on those. And one of the lessons that my dad gave me was whenever you're angry, instead of saying something out loud, sit down, get a piece of paper and a pen, and write it down. And then when you're done, throw that away. 
Like, throw it away. Because the very first thing that you're going to say, that definitely, you don't want to say that. The very first thing you're going to write, it's going to be a little bit more polished, but you still don't want to send that off to someone. Like, maybe write something again a little bit later, and you'll get it right. But when you first kind of just shoot off, right, it's, it's like a version of blowing up. It doesn't bring unity. It causes problems. Proverbs 14, 29 says, people with understanding control their anger. Notice what this verse says, is that anger is not a sin. It's not wrong to be angry. I hope that when you turn on the news, there are things that you see on the, on the TV that make you angry. <laughs> like, man, this really frustrates me. This makes me really angry. I can't stand that this is happening to so-and-so or such-and-such right now. But it says people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. And James shows us how we should behave instead in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Remember, in this life, we're not trying to win arguments we're trying to win people to Jesus, all right? So we wanna make sure we don't blow up instead of fixing a problem. The other thing we like to do instead of fixing a problem is we like to stir up. When I think right now of the people, when I said as a pastor, in these last eight years, I've really struggled sometimes with feelings of hatred towards other people. I will tell you, for me, it all revolves around people stirring stuff up. People trying to create a problem where there is none. People finding uh, calm water and saying, what can I do to get this puppy, you know, all messed up? And for some reason, we find joy in stirring stuff up. It is, if we're all being honest, gossip is really fun, isn't it? We don't want to be on the outside of good gossip. We want to hear it. We want to know if there's someone who screwed up and it wasn't you, I want to know all about it. Tell me. Right? That's just our human nature, but that's just stirring stuff up. I, I love this. If you've ever wondered, what is gossip? I know the Bible says we're not supposed to do it. But one of the best definitions I've ever heard was from Rick Warren, and he says this. He says, gossip is when we are talking about a situation with somebody who is neither part of the problem nor part of the solution. When I'm talking about an issue a problem that's arisen, and I'm talking to you, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't know why you're telling me this, because I can't help it, and I had nothing to do with it. That's gossip. On the other hand, if I'm talking to someone who might be able to fix the problem, or maybe it was part of the problem, that's not gossip. That's helpful. And so one of the things we do, right, we, we gossip. We like to bring things up. It says in Proverbs 20, verse 19, a gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around with chatterers. About Proverbs 15, 18, it says, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. You see, some people like to get the water turning, and some people like to slow the water down back to calm. And you see, we don't want to be the one who stirs up conflict. So when somebody comes to you and they're sharing something with you and you're thinking, you know what, I'm not sure, is this gossip or not? Should I be hearing this? Is this helpful? Ask yourself some questions. Like, hey, is what they're saying to me right now, is this helpful or harmful? Are they trying to solve a problem or create a problem? Am I the person who they're telling this to? Am I part of the solution or part of the problem? If not, guess what you can do? Oftentimes, The way that most of us are guilty of gossip is we think, well, I'm not the one saying nothing. I'm just listening. But you have the ability to hear gossip as it's happening and just say simply this word. Ready? I want you to memorize this. It's pretty simple. Stop, please. Stop. Hey, I don't feel like this information, I I can do anything about it. I'm not part of the solution. And it doesn't sound like I'm part of the problem. So why don't you hold on, save your breath, and go talk to someone who can help you. Go talk to someone who can help fix this instead of stirring things up. The Bible says that we're called instead to resolve problems quickly. 
right? In Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, it says this really clearly. It says, don't let, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. I want to understand this word foothold right here. If you go back to the original Greek, it's the word uh, topos. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Greek expert, come correct me, all right? T-O-P-O-S, topos, topos. And what that word technically means is, is a, an, it's another a word for room, like a room in a house. So it says, don't, don't go to bed angry because when you do, what you're actually doing is you're, it's like you're going into your house and you're making up the guest bedroom, you're putting out your nice towels, you're getting everything ready, you're vacuuming, you're getting a, a guest room ready for Satan to hang out in your mind. That's what happens. You're giving a room to the devil when you don't take care of issues when they arise. You're just letting the, the Satan kind of stir in your mind. And so what we can do instead, right, and say, listen, I don't want to give uh, the devil room in my marriage. I don't want to give the devil room in my family. I don't want to give the devil room in my church. I don't want to give the devil room in my life group. I don't want to give the devil room in nothing I got going on. So as soon as a problem arises, what I can do, instead of giving a, a foothold, a room to Satan to just fester, I can deal with it quickly. You know, it's, I found it's really hard sometimes in that I want to deal with a problem quickly, and the person on the receiving end, like, is ghosting me. You know what I'm talking about? Like, hey, I feel like there's a little bit of tension between us last time we were talking. I think I might have offended you in some way. Can we talk about it? Just nothing. Like, hey, I, I really care about our relationship. I want to restore whatever's broken. Can we, maybe let's meet face to face and, and just get, get through this. Especially worse when they respond back saying, hey, I don't want to talk about it. Like, what, what do you do with that, right? Here's what you're responsible to do. When you know that there's a problem, do everything in your power to go to the person who's part of the problem or part of the solution and deal with it. And if you get ghosted on the other end, well, they're going to have to answer to God for that. But you've done everything in your power to, to make every effort right for that bond of peace. Try to take care of it right away. And by the way, sometimes when you have a problem with another believer, Christ and you are having some sort of issue, and you've been trying to work it out, just the two of you, there's nothing wrong with bringing in a third party to help you work through it. Sometimes we'll have people call the church and just say, hey, we're having this issue. Could a pastor just sit in and just mediate for us? We love doing that because we want to help you bring yourselves back together in a bond of peace. Here's the third thing, right? If, you want, if we want to be a church that's unified, you need to hope for the best in your church family. Hope for the best in your church family. Have you ever noticed that we often instead, we kind of just assume the worst in other people? I don't know why our sin nature likes to do that, but what if instead we just assumed Hey, here's a good example of this. I've noticed we often judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. You maybe I'll give you an example. Maybe you've had an, a conversation with someone before, and they've said something to you that was deeply offensive. And on their end, they had no idea that they were being offensive. They didn't realize this was a sensitive subject. They didn't realize this was a no-go talk thing. They had no idea that this was an area that they just haven't been trained on how to talk about it properly. And so we judge them by their actions instead of by their intentions. You know those moments where you're like, there's a bunch of traffic backing up, leading to like an exit, and you realize, listen, I can get, I, I gotta get into this line now and I just kind of got to wait my turn to take this exit. And as soon as you get up to the front of that exit, there's that one guy in lane two, right, who's like, oh, I'm just going to sneak in. I've been, I've been zooming past this whole line, and now I'm going to get in at the last minute. I hate that guy. I'm like, nope, not me, buddy. I make sure my bumper is real close. They're like, not get in front of me. And I'm hoping the guy behind me is just as mean as I am. I'm like, nobody let him in. Nobody let him in. But here's the thing. I've been that other guy for good reason. 
There's been moments in my life, right, where there's an emergency happening, there's a, a pro, I'm late for a really important deadline, and nobody else in that line has anything, has no idea what's going on in my life. But I've been the guy thinking, I hope someone shows me grace today and lets me in, because boy, am I running late. Boy, do I need to get somewhere quickly. And so we judge other people differently than the way we judge ourselves. In those moments, I'm like, hey, my intentions are great. I would have waited, but today I'm running behind somebody show, you know, my intentions are fine, but everyone else in line is judging me based on my actions. And so the truth is, if we could just learn to hope for the best in other people, when somebody says something to you that offends you, instead of just assuming that they mean the worst possible version of what they just said, go to them and say, hey, when you said that thing, I'm going to assume that you meant this, or you meant something good or kind, but I just want you to know the way I received it, it was a little different, so maybe we could work through this. Show grace to people. Hope for the best in them. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So give people the benefit of the doubt when they're speaking to you that whatever they just said that maybe offended you, that maybe they were trying their best to build you up. They were trying to say something helpful. And maybe when you respond to them, make sure you say something helpful because we're supposed to be doing our best effort to build this bond of peace, all right? I've also learned, I've had people, it's really frustrating as a pastor, but I've had people believe things about me simply because someone else told them something about me. That wasn't true. And what was most hurtful about it, I was like, man, the person that was the middleman, the person who's hearing this third party, like they got to decide in that moment, are they gonna believe this kind of random person is saying something, or are they gonna make a a decision based on their experience with me and my character? And it hurts when they're like, it's kind of more fun just to assume the worst in people. And they believe it. And we do that often to other people. So let's hope for the best. Now, oftentimes, have you ever given someone the benefit of the doubt and then they let you down? You just assumed that they had good intentions. And you're like, you listen, brother or sister in Christ, I'm going to assume that because I know your character, I'm going to assume that what that person just said isn't true. I know you better than that. And they're like, oh, no, it's true. And you're like, oh, man. <laughs> well, here's the deal. We're all going to make mistakes. And so the fourth thing is probably the most important one, and it's this. Treat others the way God has treated you. The person sitting to your right, the person sitting to your left, the person up on this stage, (laughs) all of us are going to let you down. We're going to do something that offends you. And what you can decide right now is saying, listen, man, I've done all sorts of things to offend God. Every time I step out of his will, I do things my own way. It's an offense to God. But he loves me so much, he sent his son to die on the cross, and then his son conquered death and rose again so I could be in relationship with him. If God is willing to forgive me of all the junk in my life, then I certainly should be able to forgive brothers and sisters in Christ who offended me. We should be able to forgive each other. It doesn't mean we just overlook Sin, it doesn't mean that when someone sins against you, you're like, hey, I forgave you, no big deal, let's just move on, right? I mean, certainly, yes, it's, it's probably not a big deal, we probably can move on. We still, as a church, we wanna tackle sin when it pops up, right? We wanna grow from it. In fact, there's this verse in Ephesians 4, 2 that says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Read a verse like this, and it sounds like what Paul is saying, hey, listen, when other people around you sin, just go ahead and allow it. It It's not a huge deal. That's not what he's talking about here. Let me tell you what he's talking about here. Every one of us in this room, we have different quirks and personality traits and words that we use and things that we have, an accent we have or whatever. We We all have these different things about us that are unique. And sometimes you'll find that that little personality quirk or that trait that you have annoys other people. In fact, that's why they call it a quirk. By the way, every one of us in this room, you have a quirk that annoys other people. 
And what the Bible says, listen, a quirk isn't necessarily like a sin thing. It's just like a personality chemistry thing. You just, someone talks too much. You're like, man, that guy just won't close his mouth, right? And it's just this quirk. But the Bible says, listen, one of the things we can do is we can make allowance for each other's quirks. We can make allowance for each other's faults and still love each other because Jesus makes all sorts of allowances for our quirks. In fact, he gave us some of our quirks, all of our quirks. Some of us we probably gave ourselves. So God is patient with you, and therefore we ought to be patient with other people. God forgave you, and so we ought to forgive other people. When someone in this church wrongs you or offends you, treat them the way God has treated you. And say, you know what? Let's move past this together. I forgive you. So we end our messages here with a prayer. Can you guys say it with me? What now, God? Right? What now, God? I want to challenge you on a few things. And I know we do a what now, God, every, every week. So it can be easy to just kind of like zoom past this and not really think about these things. But I legitimately, I want you to ask this prayer. And I want you to pray this to God. And I want you to take one of these things that I'm about to throw out there and I want you to do one of them, all right? Here, here's, here's the first question. Do you have a pastor or a life group leader or a ministry leader, someone that you've placed on a pedestal? Can you please remove them from that and just recognize that they are sinners, broken, messed up people just like you? Are you harboring right now frustration against someone else in this church, a brother or sister in Christ? Maybe they've offended you in some way. They've said something and you've just been like, you know what? I'm going to let it go, but it's not letting go. You just keep holding on to it. Would you take care of that today? Would you send them a text and ask them to go out to lunch sometime soon? Give them a call and say, hey, I feel like there's some tension between us and I want to work it out because you're my brother or sister in Christ. Are you allowing your temper to destroy a relationship with someone in this room? Knock it off. Are you allowing problems to stir up with your gossip? Are you saying things about other brothers and sisters in Christ to other brothers and sisters in Christ who are not part of the problem and not part of the solution just to stir up some things and to be the one guy who's got all the information? Stop it. Are you assuming the worst in others instead of hoping the best for them? Stop it. Are you refusing to give forgiveness to someone in this body of Christ who has wronged you? I would challenge you to go back and look at the way Jesus loves you and go to them and grant them the forgiveness that you've been holding back. You know, we know in scripture that Jesus said, right, I will build my church. Nothing can stop it. We also know that Satan wants to do everything he can to try to stop it. And what does he use? He often uses people as the tools that he's going to try to use to slow down the growth of the church. So here's my final what now, God. You ready? Don't be a tool. Don't be a tool. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this chance that we have to get together as the church. God, we recognize that as believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we gather together, you call us to this bond of peace. You call us to have that kind of peace so that we're not distracted when we come to worship you. We're not thinking about problems and issues within the church, but instead we gather together with one unified purpose, which is just to to fulfill your great commission while we, while we worship you and glorify you. Father, we ask that you'd help us to do that. And help show each of us today what it is that we need to adjust in our life, conversations we need to have, how we can live in a way that's not so easily offended so that we can be a church united and unified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, 
will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.